Hello, my name is Peter Sárosi. I'm the director of the Rights Reporter Foundation and the editor of the Drug Reporter website. And today this is our third uh, live stream session from here, Amsterdam, at the International AIDS Conference. And today we will uh, discuss uh, something which is usually overlooked at HIV conferences and it's about criminalization of drug users and drug policy reform. And I have a guest speaker here with me, David Subiliani, who is uh, an activist from uh, Georgia, Republic of Georgia. And uh, he is a, a, a member of the White Noise Movement, which was uh, which get, got some uh, pu international publicity uh, recently. So, uh, David, we know that Georgia is actually one of the most has one of the most repressive drug policies. And uh, I just saw some data that. Uh, in the past seven years, there were 300,000 uh, street uh, drug people were street drug tested. And it's like the 10% of the Georgian population. It's just amazing or in, uh, unbelievable. How 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 get you how, how did you get here? I mean, wh why why Georgia is so repressive in that where where this repression is coming from? Uh, thank you, Peter. And first of all. Um um, I want to thank you for what you do, because uh, you, you bring news and reports uh, and from a very macroscopic uh, perspective uh, to all of us and let us you know, reflect on, on regional things and global things and not, and not only working on local sense. And um, that's a very important piece of work you are doing and um, full support from, from activists on that. Uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me also. And Well, I don't know why, why Georgia got so strict drug policy but uh, I mean after breaking down Soviet Union uh, we had number of civil wars and we had uh, breakaway regions South Ossetia, Abkhazia which Russia has later announced as independent countries so like, and we had basically a war with Russia uh, and uh, during those times the heroin supply uh, uh, was at its maximum I think and uh, you know Every second, every everybody, every, every family had someone sent to, to war. You know, fighting for for a home country. Um, many of those people got on drugs, and heroin's been supplied easily through the conflict zones uh, with the help of the militaries from both sides and Russian Federation, I guess, also. Um, so when the time for rebuilding the state came. Uh, with previous governor Mikhail Saakashvili. Uh, he started with the Queen Queen projects and one of those was uh, to combat the criminal because after the war everybody had a gun. Pe you know, people were being killed in the streets and stuff like that. So Saakashvili said zero tolerance to criminal and we were happy about that because he was he was the leader who was able to carry out the reforms. And we were naive also. We didn't think about the drug users back then. But under the zero tolerance policy, basically later on we learned is that the, most of the people who, who were affected with that policy, most of the people who were incarcerated, it was the drug users. Because uh, drug use was basically an easy, easy entry point for police to, to, reach, this, to, uh, to reach out to, 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 to people to, they wanted to see in prisons and send them to prison. Um, heroin supplies also were cut. Uh, those who escaped the prison, they went to the uh, so-called, you know, they went into a hide. They went to basement basically, and uh, we wouldn't see syringes, used syringes anymore on the entrances of the living blocks. But but obviously, drug use didn't disappear. It just got more hidden, and that was the time when we really first saw drug users shifting from one drug to another drug and usually as it happens the, the other drug that, that, that people are forced to go to is this more poisonous have, having worse uh, effect on the health of, of, of these people uh, it was we had we had desomorphin like the so-called crocodile well known uh, in our region uh, basically, it's, it's a drug that's, that's um, prepared uh, in a kitchen-like you know, uh, environment with a lot of risks of you know, making a mistake somewhere and then having a final product very poisonous. So a lot of people lost their lives or their health 
and general attitude also from public was that you know the drug use is something really horrible, something really bad. It took us more than a decade to create the awareness, and it, it wasn't easy because it's in with previous government it wasn't really okay to to come up on the street and demand a decriminalization or something like that. Max would do write a petition or something, and nobody would pay attention. There were some NGOs, of course who were working, but their voices were not really heard. And there were also drug user associations that came as part of the bigger umbrella global fund uh, initiative to combat the HIV and Hep C. And those associations were there, but also they were, were not really able to having a critical impact on how the politics is done. Only in 2015, end of 15 and beginning of 16, we had a great opportunity to bring the issue on a political agenda uh, as a very important issue uh, and that was made possible with the constitutional court decision that undermined the whole legitimacy of the drug policy. Uh, the, back then, in October 2015, the constitutional court said that it was a case of one of, one of the white, white noise movement leader Bekka Tsikarishvili who had up to 70 grams of marijuana at, at his place when he was searched and he was posing 5 to 12 years imprisonment and there was a great campaign run by his friends saying Becca is not criminal Becca is not criminal. it was very viral and even my, you know, people from our parents generations would join in and, and like entire like community, the wider community, not only the drug users got into the campaign and they would say, yeah, Becca isn't criminal. Everybody was like, yeah, he doesn't belong to prison. Something is wrong with, with the system. But this case turned out to be the most critical one, crucial one, that changed everything, that really allowing us to uh, run the advocacy programs later on uh, and campaigns. And Constitutional Court said, yeah, this guy doesn't belong to prison. The, the law that sends him to prison is against the Constitution. And that was the big, biggest achievement that, 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 that really crafted the whole shape and shaped the whole, whole campaign later on. That was the, also the beginning of White Noise Movement. The whole idea of establishing an organization that can, and a movement that can achieve the decriminalization of drug users, not drugs, as, as many people say. Um, uh, we saw that that was a feasible project because we had enough arguments generated locally, uh, but also internationally. But also we had this legal provision from Constitutional Court that was giving a leverage for our future campaigns. So we said, okay, something we didn't believe was ever possible, we can do it now. We can do it now and once we got Becca saved, we realized that we can do a bigger project. Uh, so we said, let's do white noise. And it was Becca's idea to call it white noise. White noise is the you know, when you turn a TV to a channel where you don't get a signal and it's, shh, it's really unpleasant, really uncomfortable, you have to turn it down. Um, that's the white noise. We said, we will, we will make a noise that will be totally uncomfortable for you guys, the government, the society, in general society. I mean, they need, needed to listen, listen to what we were talking about. Uh, and it worked, in par par partially. We didn't get decriminalization yet, but what we really got, and may maybe mo more importantly, it's more important, uh, is the support from general public. I wouldn't say we have like 80% support or 90% support, but the last two polls that were carried out by independent organizations show that more than 50% of population is in favor of decriminalization and depenalization, uh, removing uh, criminal sanctions, removing, removing prison sanctions from just being a drug user. And being a drug user means consuming a drug and having a drug in certain amounts uh, that, that can be seen as an ad adequate amount. And so these two basically articles, drug use and drug possession, should become decriminalized and that, that the project is now ongoing. It's a bit slow project, but we are hopeful that we will get there. I gave a long, long answer, sorry. No problem. Um, so uh, how, how can we just imagine like how, how this uh, street drug, res, drug, drug tests happening in Georgia? How do they happen? like? Someone is walking on the street and the policeman comes and just picks you up and takes you to the police station. How, how do they select people? Anybody can be a victim or how, how does it work? Um, 
it's a good question because we all, we always talk about some you know stuff that, that goes on uh, in our home country, but that's really hard to imagine because really we would say sometimes that this this street testing, this massive street testing, proactive one, was the Georgian know-how to the war on drugs, the worldwide war on drugs. Georgia also contributed greatly to that war with that innovation. Basically, it was. Um, with zero tolerance policy, once the mission actually said, everybody to prison, everyone to prison. And um, they needed mechanisms to get that. Uh, I mean, people who had who were like obvious drug users and were part of the dealing or whatever, they were tackled first. But they needed to fill up the prison. So what, they, what you do then, you, you start looking into people's organisms and molecules uh, and cells and see the remainings of illicit drugs there. So they came up with the idea to massively test people on the street and uh, they would do numbers like 50,000, 40,000 a year. That's like one, two percent of population. Most of these people are males, young males. You know, something that you suspect could be, could fall in, a, most of the drug users m might fall, fall in. And um, it was totally up to policemen's sub subjective individual uh, doubt by looking at you uh, you know, if I'm a policeman, I look at you and say, oh, I think he might be on drugs or he might be a drug user. So I come and I have all right to take you, to stop you from where you're going. Maybe you have an appointment. Maybe you're going to an airport to fly somewhere. They wouldn't care. They would say, just follow us to a testing unit. Uh, you get tested there. If it's the first time that they find it's an administrative offense, you pay $500. That's like around 200 euro, maybe. And the second time, within a year, uh, that would be a criminal offense, uh, possibly sending you to prison. Um, so what we really realized later on, looking into statistics, was that there was a growing trend of policemen coming back to people whom, they've, whom they det detected once have, having a, dru having, having a dru drug use incidence, incident, and, and they would try to reach these people again within one year. It, with the hope to criminalize them. Because, of course, policemen also know that people who use drugs do not stop using drugs just because they had a, uh, you know, interaction at one point with police forces. You know, they wouldn't stop using drugs. So that was a good opportunity for them, you know, where they could kind of fill up the statistics. So we would see people arrested on, like, two days remaining until this one, one year gap go, goes by. So like, like policemen really looking into records and saying, okay, where, wh wh whose, whose term is expiring? And we would just knock, knock their door and say, we have a doubt that you have a drug. So that was really horrible. And um, later on when uh, uh, Georgia was joining, um, you, I think it's East Neighborhood, East Neighborhood, what is it called? East European Neighborhood Project, something, or, or it was a vis or it was this, was economic. Okay, I will say it again. Uh, at some point, there was a pressure, international pressure. Also, uh, Georgia was joining some international treaties uh, with the European Union, and as part of the conditionality, was to review this mechanism. That basically, what Georgia did said that okay, uh, policeman is not really allowed anymore to take a subjective initiative. You know, you know, just just by his own out to check someone so that's removed but if the mechanism they implemented doesn't really change much they said that there should be an operative so-called operative information they should have some indication from someone that I have a drug in order for them to to be able to come to me and look into my urine uh, and um, it didn't change because they would easily get the get get that you know operative information if two policemen are walking by one would call the central uh, police unit saying that I saw drug users there so the record would be there the other policeman would immediately go and say there is a record that there, you might be a drug user. so basically nothing really changed what really happened later on is that activists found a possibility within the Constitution one of the articles of the Constitution saying that you are allowed entitled not to give a testimony that can be used against you and that was like extended that principle was extended to the biological sample as well. So you are entitled not to give a biological sample if that can be used against you. And we had a precedent like that, and court allowed that. 
So that we started to advocate, and we, we started to give the information. <laughs> but no, you, you have all rights not to cooperate with police on that case. If, if they want your your urine, but obviously many many people, especially young people who have had no no experience of dealing with police, they are so frightened when it's the first time police arrests you. You want you just want to cooperate with them, <laughs> and then then they have the good policeman, bad policeman, you know, good cop, bad cop system. That's that hairy way. So, <laughs> Just, just, you better do that. Otherwise, your brothers, sisters, family members, neighbors, everyone will hear and you know, we will continue pressurizing on you. So you just, you just better do that. So still, many, many people would cooperate. It's so hard for us, but as the numbers, we're growing on our side. People not cooperating because we white noise also would, would, would go there. We would not let anyone behind. We would just go to these testing units with, with video cameras and. Uh, Facebook Live, President. the people. Do not urinate. We are here to help you. It's your right, uh, you know. And policemen would just, would just try to, you know, push us out. And we wouldn't let, go, we wouldn't come out. So it was like constant struggle, constant like physical fight going on. And we had that. That was the also way to gain more and more supporters to the white noise movement membership. Um, I wouldn't say that this. Drug testing, street drug testing is gone fully, but it's like uh, really minimized. In 2000, the first year of, of the current government taking over from the previous, we had drug test within one year. Now, now this number is down to 20,000. So that's an certain, certainly an achievement, but, but, but it's not eradicated. Uh, in our reform package, we had new mechanisms for drug testing, and this like massive street testing would be totally removed. But police was against it. I don't know what the parliamentarians' will, uh, final decision will be on that. I mean, that's that's I think incredible uh, impact and what you had uh, some results. And um, so, what can you recommend to other activists in other countries? Like, what are the lessons learned? What methods do you use? How do you use the media? So anything you can share with, with activists who would like to do similar campaigns in other countries? Sure. Um, um, first thing is, um, I mean, before I start the techniques, because the techniques can be read on, you know, you can Google and see lots of materials what you can do. Um, but that, that alone is not enough. There's no recipe. And if you do that, the campaign is going to work. The first and most important thing for me, at least, at, my personal view is that with white noise movement was that we had this freaky belief, uh, almost irrational belief that we can win this battle, and not in the long run, but in a short run. Uh, something that was missing all the time before, and therefore all the campaigns done before didn't have much power and strength. Once we had this like full belief that we can get there, and and that belief was backed with our plans and whatever. That was empowering us so much that we can do the job. Uh, but also we started with the big momentum, with the constitutional court decision. So we had we had this, you know, we can do it. And that was giving us enormous power, enormous power. And we had horizontally managed, you know, one nice was has been and is, is horizontally managed group. No, no one person who is leading. We have situational leaders, whatever. But uh, like any decision is taken by everyone. We wait until everyone is on board. You know, and we would spend endless hours discussing tiny details of what color to use here, what kind of font to use in this in this poster or whatever. And we decided that way. And we learned that we learned on the way that in order your decisions to have any impact, those decisions should be backed with participation, with real meaningful involvement of people who are around, who are the kind of stakeholders of, of, of the initiative. So that's hard to do. But that's possible, more or less, and uh, that would be one recommendation to activists that do not detach yourself from, from the supporter base, from the drug users, for which and on behalf of which you are, you're campaigning. Just always have them with, with strong say in your, in your final decisions. This way, your, your, your steps will be like really powerful. And at some point, we really realized that the power was with us. We really were feeling that power. And we would say we are a power center now. And because we have more than 2% of people following our page. So we said, whatever we say, it counts. Politicians are commenting on that. So it's like at some point we, we, we become a real power center that's seen from above. And then, then it's much easier to, to, to follow the, 
steps you might hear uh, on any website regarding how to do the good campaign. Otherwise, social media, of course, you know, we live in the 21st century. It's hard for us, it's costly for us to reach everyone. Uh, so we can use, and we have to use the social media and technology uh, that's given to us in a good way, in a nice way to reach these people. Uh, but the trap here is that do not rely on social media only because you might at point live in a bubble because your social media environment might give you an impression that the country is going this way or thinking that way. But in reality, when it comes to final decisions or elections or voting or whatever, you see the reality is a bit different. When the critical times come, you feel that people are not, not everyone is on, the, on, on board. So you have to balance between you know, these this channels. That you, have to, you have to know that these channels might not represent the whole picture. So you have to have a physical presence also. We would spend a lot of time meeting students, club goers, injecting drug users with the associations. Uh, LGBT people, uh, environmentalists, and later on we started to realize that these people started to come on our events also. There was a great cross solidarity. So f the recommendation number two would be like, find uh, synergies, find possibilities to show empathy, to receive empathy, because that's the most valuable thing that you have in your activism like appreciation from people. That, that's what give, gives you an, uh, power to stand up at 5 a.m. if there is an urgent call, to leave everything behind and go to policy unit and fight for someone. And something we have done a lot of times and uh, something that, that helped Red Noise to grow a lot. Even when we had parties like on weekends and um, we all love partying or whatever, at some point we would say, someone needs to stay sober tonight because there might be a case that someone is arrested. So what we say then, I wasn't able to come because I was high, be responsible. Eh? Because if, you, if you've taken this responsibility, you have to be there. And that's a very costly thing. I have a family, three kids, wife. I had a well-paid job, extremely well-paid job, which I left because uh, I thought that I needed to put more time to activism, like 100% in there. Uh, I wasn't, wasn't able to see my kids all the time uh, and I was always tired with that but I had enormous energy and we were really spending day and night working for, for, for the idea. So unless you get that kind of sparkle, unless you are infected massively with activism, um, your activism is not going to lead you anywhere. Uh, and once you get infected, there is no control Z from there, you stay there. So. Um, that's, that's the thing, and at the, the recommendation again to activists, something really important from my own experience is that when times go and important changes aren't materialized yet, you might get moments of frustration, you might become a bit, you know, you might lose the belief you had in the beginning, and that's what the system wants. The system wants you to see without that belief, without that you know, crazy sparkle that, that fills you up with the energy. Because when you are not filled up with an energy, it's so much easier for them to, to, to shut you down. So try to have that in mind. Try to renew the, 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 the team of activists and supporters so that there is always fresh energy there. Because when you are tired, you might need a break. Really, you know, I need a break sometimes to come back with, the, with, your, with your great energy. So plan, plan for a long time rather than like two weeks or one month or three months or six months campaigning. Because the thing we are fighting with is a big, big, big thing. And it's not just one single project that can be carried out successfully. It's a long marathon. And I started to understand that coming on this conf conferences like this, where people come here like for like last 20, 30, 40 years, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, also I wish you luck with your work in the future. Let's keep up the good fight, and I hope that we can replicate that in other countries what you are doing because it's really amazing. So thank you very much, and thank you for those who viewed us.